this is uh, Automotive Electrical Test 3, what we got. Um, and we're just talking really about simple stuff here. And if you have an inoperative horn, uh, a digital voltmeter placed across the relay load contact terminals indicates 12 volts when the horn is pushed. A click is heard from the relay when the button is pushed. Technician A says the relay is bad. Technician B says the relay call circuit is bad. Now this is an A yeah this is an ASE style question. Now what are they talking about? Why is the first guy wrong when he? I mean no, I'm sorry. He well why is the first guy wrong by the way? Because the relay is clicking. It's there is it's uh, operating when the You're hearing it click. But let's look at this for a second. That's a relay. Okay. Now then, you got B plus here, right? This is going to your horn. I'm just drawing this real simple. All right. Now then, you put this right here is basically going to go, it's going to be like that. And so this right here is going to go, your horn button is going to go here. All right, you mash the horn button. The relay goes click, but you've got right here and right here, and you're measuring with your meter, and you're eating 12 volts, right? Now, if I wasn't even blowing that horn, what would I read there? If I wasn't even blowing the horn, what would I read? I, 12 volts, why? Because you got battery power, you got a ground. Huh? I just said that. Huh? I said 12 volts. Huh? Oh, you did. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, you got to be you got to be more forceful with your voice. You know what I'm but uh, 12 volts. You're gonna read 12 volts because if you're not even blowing horn. All right. What is supposed to happen if this relay is closed like that? Where's what should be read? What should you read here? Two things should happen. The horn should go honk, and this right here should drop to zero. Right? Because, why? Then, well, actually, if there's any voltage drop, you're going to read some voltage. If you're reading 12 volts with a relay closed, what's that telling you? You're dropping all 12 volts. You're doing a voltage drop test on the relay, and the relay is actually dropping volts. Now, to be perfectly honest, you're probably not going to do that. What did I tell you about checking a horn? Horn don't work. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to mash, I'm going to see if I hear a relay click. You know, make sure it's got a relay, because not every, not every horn is a relay. You know, some of them don't. I mean, older cars. Do some do some don't, but anyway, if I'm here and if I mash the button and I go out here and I check at the horn and I don't find power at the dadgum horn, then I know uh, that I need to look and see what's going on up that way. If I do find power at the horn but it doesn't blow, what do I know? The horn ain't no good. Okay, what components in the most hostile environment and is working the hardest is the horn. It's usually going to be what fails. Now sometimes the clock spring will get ripped. You know, the clock spring is the part of the under the steering column, it carries a signal from the horn button down through the column and goes out to do it. Stuff. So if your airbag light's on and your horn's not working, you probably got a bad clock spring. Anyway, this question right here. Hey, I didn't realize you were standing there. It's a good thing I wasn't doing I'm something naughty. I'm just listening. All right. Are you, uh, you need to go teach the same class when you get back to the parts store. Wait a minute. Did he put both of these on one ticket? Does he know better no, than that? No. Did you are you going to are have you going to straighten him out on that? Yeah. Do you know how much of a problem this is going to be for me? I'll have to that to him. Yeah, make sure you tell him that everything needs to go on a separate ticket. Wow. Yeah, he, he didn't know. Yeah. And I didn't realize it until I walked It's okay in. if you're a parts house, but if you're dealing with the people in the business office over here, they like it to be split up, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. As a matter of fact, he needs to probably credit one of these Okay. You get me? Yeah. And, uh, in other words, and in other words, he needs to. Well, you want to just give me that and let me redo it? Yeah, do redo that. You know how it okay. needs to be done. Okay. okay. All right. Should I go take care that of That will make me feel better, huh? Should I, should I go take care of my building quick? Uh, well, you can take care of it. His is going to be, put his on cash. Okay, which one? That's the Kia. The Kia? Okay. Yeah. And then I'll when you right come back, back, you'll have it on cash. Okay. And charge him tax, too. Okay. A lot of tax. Okay. okay. All right, that's good. All right, so number one, what have we determined that the answer to number one is? Based on what I just told you. Now, wait a minute. B, the coil circuit is not bad. 
How do we know the coil circuit is not bad? I said V earlier and he said, yep. I know. I was just, I was only half here. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. It's A is the right answer. The relay is bad. But if the relay clicks, is the relay click? Does that mean it's good? I guess not necessarily. No, it doesn't because it can click. All you know is the coil is good and you know that it's able to make a sound. But if it's dropping all that voltage. But I'll tell you another thing. You hear the relay click, you don't see any power down there. Uh, you, you might even check down there and see if you see any power with a test light, you know, like I said earlier. Okay, let me move on before I beat a dead horse. A was, it was A, yeah, it was A. Uh, the, it's a bad relay. Technician A says when testing a grounded circuit, if a fuse blows as soon as it's installed, a short to ground is indicated. Technician B says the component will not turn off if the short to ground is on the ground side of the load component but before a grounding switch. Now, every one of these requires a, a board drawing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, let's, these words will just get you tangled. Have you ever got tangled up in words before? Yeah. You gotta think about this. Um, if you blow the fuse, as soon as you stick it in there, right? What's that telling you? I don't even have the switch on. I know I've got a blowing fuse like on the radio and my sister's 77 Caprice that time. As soon as she pushed the phone fuse in there, pop, right? What does that mean? That means either the component's bad or you got a short between the fuse and the component, right? A short meaning the wire's touching ground or it's pinched or something like that. Uh, let's see, technician B says the component will not turn off if the short in the ground's on the ground side of the load component before a grounding switch. Now what does that mean? We gotta make sure we're, we're clear about all this. Okay, let's say we got a fuse here, right? B plus, we have a component here. We've got a switch that provides ground to it, and it goes here. If I put a fuse in there and it goes pop like that, bump, 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 then I know I've got a short ground right here, or this component's bad. However, I mean, this component would have to be turned on to be bad. If I've got a short ground right here, and that fuse is not blown, it's going to go wee. It's never going to shut off, is it? Right? One time there was this uh, Ford Taurus that came in there, and whenever you would turn on your right turn signal, the windshield washers would work. And what do you think was the cause of that? It had cornering lights on it, and somebody had to take some stuff too, and they plugged the cornering lights into the washer because the connectors were really close to the thing. When they plugged them in and you turn it on while the cornering light was supposed to be on, it was just washing the windshield up a storm because it was just a two-wire connector with power. All right, uh, so number two is C. Technician A says both an ohmmeter and a self-powered test light may be used to test for continuity. Technician B says both may be used to test fuses. Both of those guys are correct, but you know what the problem is? If I grind every piece of a battery cable away except for one tiny little copper wire, my ohmmeter is going to tell me that battery cable is fine. But is it going to start a car? Heck no. It's, going to burn up. it's actually just going to either pop the wire or it's just not going to start it. So what I like to do, and like the other day, you remember, uh, this was funny because Adam was here for this. You remember that old school uh, 73 uh, Chevrolet that he was driving, that Johnny was driving when he came up day that you noticed? Uh, when he went out and started, it wouldn't start. And he was talking about some fuse under the dash and all that stuff that somebody had to fool with. And what we did is we went out there and we connected the test light to the negative battery post, which is in the side post battery. And then we touched the tip of the test light to the other end of that negative battery cable, which was right there going to an alternator bracket. And it lit the test light. And that basically said we're dropping all of our voltage on the ground side because the only ground that was available was through the bulb on that test light, right? One of them things. But the point is, using a test light, particularly a low impedance test light, is really, really good. If you've got a ground that you think is not sufficient, you're a whole lot better off to use a really, like a headlight bulb, like I got in that thing right over there, to see if it will burn that headlight bulb nice and bright. Hook your headlight bulb up to the battery, use the ground that you're checking to fire up that bulb and see if that bulb gets really dim, and that way you'll know you've got ground issues, right? In other words, if, you, if, it, if that ground won't pull that headlight bulb, it's not going to pull the other. 
Um, I have another thing. This is important. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't tell you and all that. Make sure you stay awake and get coffee if you need it. Bless her heart uh, over there. I had that give blood a while ago. That's rough. But anyway, uh, what we get here, we've got a, the ranger one time. Remember, tell me if I've told you this story before. The ranger just suddenly got to where it wouldn't start. I did not plant this bug. I turn on the key, no fuel pump. I go back here, we, we take the bed off the truck and we set it back out of the way so we can get to the pump real easy right where it is. I get my test light, and this is my regular test light, and I check, and there's power there. Well, that's interesting. And so I unplug the connectors that's going to the pump, and I hook the test light in there from the ground in the connector to the pin that's feeding the pump. And the, the test light comes on. All right, what are you thinking now? I've actually checked the circuit with my test light, with my regular test light like I use, and that light comes on. I pull the pump out of the truck. I lay it on the bench over here with, you know, in a drain pan so it doesn't make a gassy mess all over the bench. And I put power of ground to it, and it goes, wee. Nothing wrong with the pump. Put it back in the truck. Maybe I jarred it or something. Put it back in the truck, put it back in, check it out. You know, it still won't run. It'll burn my test light. Then I go get my headlight bulb. I get my headlight bulb. I hook it between the ground and the power on that Ranger. It will not burn that headlight bulb. But it let my test light. Why? The test light's pulling about a quarter of an amp. The headlight bulb, if you use the bright size, pulling about six amps, which is about what the fuel pump pulls, right? Got me? You understand why you had to put a load on that circuit to tell? That was a perfect example of why a meter and a test light aren't good enough for checking loaded circuits. And, but in a lot of these schools, they'll teach you don't ever use a test light on anything because you'll burn up the engine controller. With all due respect to those people, I've never burned up anything and I used a test light for 25 years. And I was working on computer systems and everything else. Now, if you're, if you're dumb and you're checking something you're not supposed to be checking with a test light, you might cause damage, but I know what to check with a test light and what not to. So don't tell me not to use one, you know. Now, anyway, self-powered test light is what? It's a test light that's got batteries in it. So that when you take the, the clip for that light and touch it to the tip, uh, it's gonna actually light the little bulb in the light and you, you're checking for continuity, but that's not really all that great anyway. A voltmeter placed across the terminals of an inoperative electric window motor indicates 12 volts when the window switch is depressed. Technician A says the window ground circuit may be faulty. Technician B says the window power feed circuit may be faulty. Uh, that D, neither A nor B. Now, the power windows are basically going to be fed through a switch that reverses the polarity. I'm not going to try to draw that because I'd probably make a mess of it. Uh, but basically, it reverses the polarity. If you unplug your power window motor, this is your power window motor. You unplug your power window motor and you actually check right here and you better use your load carrying light like I was talking about like your headlight. I'm going to get this out of the way. I'm going to bend this over here. I'm going to hook up a good strong load here and we'll see if it lights. Now something else I like to do on power windows, if I've got a power window that's not working, first thing I'm going to do is try to operate that power window and I'm going to look at the dome light. Why am I looking at the dome light? If the dome light goes dim, I know power is making it to that motor, but it's just bound up or something. If I pull that switch and the light don't go dim, I've either got an open circuit, or got a bad motor, something. So if you go right here and you got power on the ground, then I want to go here with my jumper box. And I, was that, that wasn't you that did that was setting a jumper box out here, was trying to hook it to ground on the jumper box and check something on the car? That wasn't you, was it? No, that was somebody else. Okay. Uh, but uh, anyway. Power and ground here, the motor should go one way, power and ground the other way, it should go the other way. You can actually check that. You can build you a little test box with a rocker switch in it or something, or a couple of relays, you know. All right. So, anyway, on number four, neither one of those guys were right. Uh, the leads of a digital, volt, uh, digital multimeter with a diode check function are placed across the terminals of a diode and then reversed. A 0.6 volt reading is obtained in both directions. Technician A says this means the diode shorted. Technician B says it means the diode is acceptable. Who's right about that? That is a shorted diode. You're supposed to read, you're going to read about 0.6 uh, one way and nothing the other way. Did you know you can check an alternator like that? You can actually take an alternator, put it on the bench, get your meter, hook it between the big post on the alternator and the frame with your diode check function selected on your meter. It's got a little picture of a diode on there, you know, a little symbol. You put it on diode, you hook it one way, if it reads that way, you turn it around, it shouldn't read the other way. If it doesn't read either way, you know, you touch them together, you can see how it's supposed to be. 
if it doesn't read one way but it does read the other way, you're good. Uh, if it doesn't read both ways or it does read both ways, it's bad. But if it passes that test, that doesn't mean the alternator is good because there's other things that can be wrong with it. So keep that in mind too. Um, but anyway, uh, number six. <coughs> Technician A says maximum current will flow through zero ohms of resistance. Technician B says infinity will not allow current to flow. That's when that's measuring on uh, on a meter, and that's both of those guys are right. The infinity means there's not, no continuity there. Um, in, uh, technician A says a stepped resistor should be disconnected from the circuit before testing it. Technician B says that a relay may be tested while it's connected to the circuit. Who's right about that? Both of those guys are right. If you can test a relay. I mean, and I've got these little uh, relay, these little boxes in here that you can actually plug into a relay socket and then plug the relay to, into it and it's got some exposed terminals where you can check them. What did you say three was? Huh? Three? Three? Uh, la, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, the three is right. They, both those guys are right. See? Uh, what will a Zener diode do at breakdown voltage? You know the answer to that one, don't you, Adam? Uh, it's A, isn't it? It lets reverse current flow when it gets to a certain voltage. That's the difference between a Zener diode and a regular diode. So if the voltage on one side of a Zener diode that's not allowed, able to get through rises above the breakdown voltage of that Zener diode, it then lets voltage go in both directions. Um, and that's, they use them for voltage regulators and all. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff Zener diodes are used for. Technician A says damage can occur to solid state circuitry. I'm just stumbling along my words. Technician A says damage can occur to occur to solid state circuitry if the charging voltage is allowed to get too high. Would that be correct? I would, I would guess so. Yeah, you can damage solid state circuitry. Technician B says damage can occur if the vehicle is allowed to run with a battery disconnected. Who's correct about that? Both of those guys are right. For years and years we were taught to disconnect the battery and if the vehicle kept running then we had a good alternator. And it goes. Huh? Had it goes. Yeah. But that is not a good way to do that because you could burn something real fast. Incidentally, I've worked on vehicles that were struck by lightning and came in for various different problems. And this one vehicle was driving down the road and was the, the radio antenna was struck by lightning and it literally vaporized the radio antenna. I mean, it was actually some molecular metal spray on the windshield where it just, just blasted it out of existence. Must have scared the daylights out of whoever was driving it. Man, do you know what was destroyed on the car? Tires. It wasn't the radio. The engine controller was destroyed, but the radio was just fine. <laughs> I mean, but the radio was, you know, hooked to the antenna. So it was grounded, though, basically. So somehow or another, it managed to put a surge of voltage through the engine controller that made it go south. Another thing that will destroy, I had, and I love to tell these stories because it's good for you guys to hear them. And I know that this kind of keeps you from turning into a skeleton. This, um, cable TV truck that had a bucket truck. It was a bucket truck and it came in and they says, and they, they gave it to me after they had given it to the new car department about three or four times and they says, once a month we have to put a new dash radio in this truck and it had just an AM FM. It wasn't even a tape or none of that. And they says, it comes in with the radio dead and it's already had four radios put in it and Ford's not going to pay for any more radios. We need to know what's causing these radios to die. And we can we can put one more radio in it, but we got to do that. So imagine that kind of pressure. You're going to have to figure out what's killing this radio. Well, what did I thinking about beginning with? They've modified the truck. How did they modify the truck? They put a bed on it with a bucket. Well, how's the bucket operated? Hydraulically. How's the hydraulic pump driven? It's driven by a shaft that goes all the way up in the engine compartment. It's got a belt around a jack shaft with a magnetic clutch on it, kind of like an air conditioner compressor clutch. Well, an air conditioner compressor clutch has got a clamping diode. I could use that same thing. You know, you got this coil wrapped it around, 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 around. You got wires going to it. And you got a diode in here that's between those two. All right, B plus comes in here, and then you got a ground here. All right, what happens is whenever this magnetic field collapses, when you turn off, the, the relay turns off the clutch, what happens then, if you don't have this clamping diode in here, you're subject to see some 400 volt spike come shooting out of this thing, and it typically makes its way through the circuits back to the engine controller and just fries it. So they put the clamping diode in there for a reason, 
See, the current can't go backwards through it. It can only go around. But whenever that thing de-energizes and that magnetic field sweeps across those copper windings and creates all that voltage, it chases its tail and goes away. Even these little relays, these little relays here, you might notice that when you see these little relays, typically they'll even show you on the schematic of the relay, it's got a little clamping resistor for the same reason. Because they don't want that thing bouncing 50 volts or more out of it to go back to whatever was energizing it. Okay, long and the short of it was, that thing did not have a clamping diode on the, on the clutch that was operating the PTO for that hydraulic pump. How did I find that? I went into the, uh, pull the radio out of the dash, I went into the power circuit going into the radio with my oscilloscope. I had my oscilloscope over here that was tracing across. It was an old one like the one on this blue card out here that doesn't work anymore. And I was looking at it while I turned stuff off and on. Turn this off, turn that off, turn this on, turn that on. Finally, I, with the key on, I turned on that compressor. I mean, that not compressor, that magnetic clutch. And when I turned it off, my scope would boom, shot off the chart. I said, I know what's frying this darn thing. And so I went and got, a, got them to get me a diode from Radio Shack, and I just soldered a little diode in between the power and the ground on that, just like the compressor clutch, and they never had any more radio trouble ever again. That's a pretty cheap fix. Yeah, it was. And, uh, so anyway, uh, these are good stories, and they, they're basically instructive, and you will not get this anywhere else except for right here, unless you do a lot of work like I did. Um, let me see. Uh, technician A says, wait a minute. Yeah. Te well, let me see. Where am I at? We had okay, technician A says a Zener diode is an excellent component for regulating voltage. Technician B says when a circuit's open suddenly due to a large load such as a coil, installing a clamping diode provides a bypass for the electron. Ta-da, that's what I was just talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah, so both of those guys are right. Hey, Brian, go turn the air conditioner down because they've just about put Curtis to sleep over there. I mean, turn it down so it's not blowing heat on us. Hey, it heard, it knew I was sending it over there. It went off by itself. And turn it, turn the temperature down some. <coughs> okay. Let me see. Now, uh, technician A says to test fuses, you could use a voltmeter or a test light. Technician B says a voltmeter and a test light are hooked in parallel. And that's C, basically, you're hooking it, you know, power and ground. And that, that's, yeah, that's right. To use a transistor as a simple solid state relay, what conditions must occur? What do you think? The emitter base junction must be forward biased and the collector base junction must be reverse biased. Now, you know what a transistor is, right? Transistor looks like that. Got three terminals, basically. All right. Talked about that on the first day of class. You remember that? That's a transistor. If this is positive and this is positive, that'll be negative. That is a PNP. When you ground that, this current's allowed to flow. That's what a transistor does, basically. Doesn't have any moving parts, though, right? And then you can also have one that'll provide ground if you uh, put positive to the base. Which, which, uh... This B. No, which terminals on that are the collector, emitter, and base? Oh, the, oh, oh, I need to show you that, too. I'm sorry. Well, if you're going to draw the schematic in the way that we like schematics to be drawn, the place where the power is delivered, where you so you got B plus, you got nothing there, and then you got your your uh, your negative. So, you know. so the negative would be base. Yeah, and so this right here would be the emitter, and that'd be the collector. Okay. Got it. That's how that works. All right. I think you knew that, and you were just seeing if I knew it. Well, no, I was <laughs> curious, because I couldn't remember, but yeah. then when I thought about it. Yeah, you know, well, you're a smart cookie, too. Obviously, power comes in, it collects the power. <laughs> yeah. Technician A says a shorted circuit can generate excessive heat. Technician B says a shorted circuit will cause the circuit protection device to open. Who's right about that? Is that B? Or no, that's both, right? That's actually C, uh, a shorted circuit. Circuit protection device is what? What are they talking about when they say circuit protection device? It off, so yeah, it fuse, circuit breaker, something like that, yeah, circuit protection. Okay, and a, a shorted circuit, what happens when you when you short something out? How many of you guys have had the distinction of burning up a jumper wire? Have you done that, Quincy? What happens to the jumper wire? Not me. I've never done that before. It gets mighty darn hot, doesn't it? Yeah, Johnny, uh, bless his heart, was over there at the Kiwanis Fair the other day when all these boards laid out and everything, and I had my little juice box over here feeding a bunch of 
uh, my other displays, and all of a sudden, all of my displays went down. Ooh. Like, and I said, Johnny, what are you doing? And I saw the wire starting to get hot, and he goes, no, no. He didn't. Well, he actually got to let him touch somehow. And then, uh, I, did, I did that, remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's scary when it happens, because you're, but when you grab it, the wire's hot, you know, and all that. But anyway, um, let's see, which of the following is true about a clamping diode? What about it? A, it's used to protect some solid state circuitry. Uh, also, there's some of the idle air controls on these Fords have got a built-in uh, clamping diode, you know, that was early on they were causing some issues. Uh, also, i tell you something else. Uh, I had a uh, Aerostar one time that came in that would, when you'd crank it up, about every other time you cranked it up, it would run terrible. But when, sometimes when you crank it up, it would run just fine. And I put my oscilloscope on the, uh, across the terminal from between ground and the terminal that was coming from the starter, uh, you know, which is actually, the, the solenoid is actually a little fender on those forwards, on the lower forwards. And when I put that on there, when I started it up, when I released the starter, I, I got a big voltage spike. And what was wrong with that was there was no diode in the uh, starter relay. And it was ever, about every other time the, uh, that voltage kick would go in there and kick the engine controller in the teeth, it would run bad. Um, let me see, uh, how much resistance is in a 12 volt circuit drawing 4 amps? 3 ohms. Good man, he knows that ohms law, doesn't he? 3 ohms is correct. Okay, we don't lack much. A voltmeter that's connected across the input and output terminals of an instrument cluster illumination lamp rheostat indicates 12.6 volts with the switch at the maximum brightness position and the engine off. Which of the following statement is true? A. The Fire. voltage available to the lamps will be no volts. That is incorrect. Quincy, is your plane going down with both engines on fire? All right. Now, what are you measuring when you measure it that way? Look at that. Output, input, and output terminals of an instrument cluster aluminum illumination lamp rheostat. Now, when you, as the lights go dim, the, the voltage drop goes up, right? You're dropping the voltage on the at the rheostat. Yeah, that's the only older cars you don't use rear stats anymore. Whenever the brake pedal is pressed, the left rear and right rear tail lights and the left rear and right rear brake light of a vehicle illuminate dimly. Technician A says the brake lights may have a poor ground connection. Technician B says the brake light switch may have excessive resistance. He's a yo-yo. It's only going to be A. You know, the brake light switch is not going to make just one side work. However, I did see a Dodge truck one time that one side of the turn signals wouldn't work. There was no bad bulb or anything. The other side would, but the other side, one side wouldn't. And I had to change a flasher. Never seen that in my whole life before, changing a flasher because one side wouldn't work. And it was one of those old kind of flashers too. Um, the horn of a vehicle equipped with a horn relay sounds weak and distorted. Which of the following is the least likely cause of the problem? A. What do you think? High resistance in the relay. Well, I don't know if it's not getting enough voltage out there. It's actually going to be D. Excessive voltage drop across the coil winding. What happens then is a lot of times it bounces the, the points. The circuit breaker that protects the power window circuit opens when the wind is lowered. Technician A says internal resistance to the motor is too high. Technician B says the window regulator may be sticking. That's B. The current draw of a window motor is being measured. Technician A says an ammeter can be connected on the power side of the motor. Technician B says it can be connected on the ground side of the motor. Who's correct about that? Neither. Excuse me? Are you just making that up? Are you just, were you just trying to be incendiary? Okay, argumentative. Number, that's C. That's both A and B. Either one of them. You don't, it doesn't matter where you put the amp meter in the circuit. All the current flowing through the circuit is going to read amp. Oh, 16. Oh, 16 turned out to be B. And the, the reason for that is because whenever you're, if you're measuring 12.6 volts across the terminals on that thing, it's basically dropping all the voltage right there. All right.